Let's not mince words here. The Ghostbusters reboot, also known as Ghostbusters Answer the Call, is a flop. On a $144 million net budget, not including advertising costs, the movie is looking to end its worldwide run at a total gross of about $230 million. While the movie's box office returns did not make the film nearly as big a bomb as some may have feared, and others may have hoped for, that's still a substantial gap between the estimated $300 million break-even point and Sony's aspirations for a scary good movie franchise that would gross between $400 million and $500 million per installment. In response to the reboot's frightening box office returns, director Paul Feig, who is currently at work preparing a sequel for his 2015 hit Spy, has stated that he will not be returning to take the reins of another movie in the Ghostbusters franchise, nor does he intend to remake any other movie from the 1980s, a decision which has been widely celebrated by the Ghostbusters fandom and audiences who are sick of unnecessary remakes alike. Who are you going to call to set this franchise straight? Someone else, evidently. The amount of damage that the movie did to Sony's coffers in the short run is somewhat disputed. On August 10, 2016, The Hollywood Reporter estimated that the Ghostbusters reboot, intended as a franchise launcher for Sony Pictures, would lose the company 70 to $75 million. A later estimate by Bloomberg, in conjunction with TheNumbers.com, put the movie's losses at a more manageable $58.6 million, merely making it the ninth biggest flop of 2016's financially disastrous summer season. And even if the reported 70 million plus loss is accurate, the film still would not be among the top five biggest losers of the season. To be fair, certain figures on this chart have been questioned, particularly in regards to Pete's Dragon from Disney and War Dogs from Warner Brothers, both of which were mid-budget films. Sony representatives have insisted that the estimated losses on their big-budget film are much smaller than they actually appear, and that the merchandise made off of the film and the Ghostbusters brand as a whole will allow them to keep going forward with future projects. While this notion is clearly spin on the company's part, it deserves to be examined in greater detail. In this video, we'll discuss why the movie didn't make enough money to break even, what kind of impact the sales of merchandise had on the movie overall, and what Sony may still be able to do with the franchise going forward. Above everything else, the key issue that Ghostbusters Answer the Call faced was that it had multiple demographic problems. The Ghostbusters brand itself is nowhere near as recognizable as competing movie franchises due to such a long period of inactivity. When rebooting a beloved 80s classic, appealing to fans of the original would typically be the first order of business in order to ensure that the movie would do decently enough, but that line of thinking was shoved out the window as soon as Sony confirmed that the reboot would be set in its own continuity and would not feature any of the original characters, a decision that would not sit well with Ghostbusters fandom at large. At first, Sony suggested that this decision was because fans didn't want to see a direct sequel passing without the involvement of Bill Murray or the late Harold Ramis. After the first trailer hit, Sony changed their narrative, suggesting that the bulk of dissatisfied Ghostbusters fans were just sexist man-children opposed to the movie's all-female premise. The focus on this narrative amped up significantly over the course of the film's promotion cycle, and Sony ultimately dismissed fans of the original as not being a part of their intended audience. The result? Sony alienated a significant portion of the Ghostbusters fandom, who would pledge to slime the movie by not seeing it. To make up for this perceived loss in a potential audience's interest, Sony tried to appeal to other demographics. Early on, posters showing close-ups of the cast were made in an attempt to appeal to young men, although based on the online response to the movie, this didn't help. Closer to the release of the film, there was a push to get children interested in the movie, as made apparent by the sizable amount of merchandise produced, but this tactic would fall short. Sony also tried to garner support from progressives through pressing on with the spin campaign, hoping that the presence of a female-led cast would bring in those wanting to see Hollywood make major changes to accommodate for growing demographics. This effort also failed due to a lack of interest from that particular audience. It's likely that the movie would have had the support of more Ghostbusters fans if Sony had instead encouraged them to keep an open mind about the movie, along with releasing statements suggesting that the reboot would honor the original. Instead, Sony's mixed messages kept fans away from the movie and alienated other potential filmgoers with placing an emphasis on political views. Beyond the Ghostbusters fan base, the other primary market that Sony was insistent upon appealing to were adult women, as they made up the market that director Paul Feig had the most success with, as evident with Bridesmaids, The Heat, and Spy. But even then, the problem with the movie was that Feig was trying to jam a square peg into a round hole, 
A movie revolving around a concept as bizarre as ghost hunting isn't going to appeal to enough older women for such a large-scale investment to be profitable, and younger women are less likely to be interested in the movie if they weren't already fans of the franchise to begin with. To be completely blunt, a genre movie starring four women was never going to be an easy sell with any major demographic, especially since, aside from Melissa McCarthy, none of the lead actresses are particularly huge draws at the box office. It also didn't help that the sleeper hit Bad Moms, a movie with the same target demographic, a more appealing a premise for said demographic, and a substantially tighter budget of $20 million, was released around the same time, drawing business away from Sony's tentpole. There were also issues promoting the movie overseas as well. Since comedy is something that is usually language-based, certain jokes might not go over well with non-English speaking audiences, something readily apparent with the movie's overseas returns. The United Kingdom and Japan are the only two international markets where the movie made over $10 million in ticket sales, and overall, the movie barely scraped past $100 million internationally with openings in over 55 markets. The movie was also banned from being screened in China due to their strict censorship policy regarding the portrayal of ghosts, since the government is staunchly opposed to anything they fear will promote superstition. It is also worth noting that not all box office returns are created equal. Movie theaters get a significant portion of each ticket sale in order to keep their facilities running. In the United States and Canada, the biggest film markets in the world, this cut translates to about 50% of the ticket cost. Overseas, the cut is higher with an average rate of 60% in most territories, and this number is as high as 75% in China. In other words, this means a studio gets 50% of the money from an American and Canadian ticket sale, 40% of the money from an international ticket sale, and 25% of the money from a Chinese ticket sale. With this in mind, $230 million made worldwide does not translate to $230 million in profit. In fact, with these restrictions in mind, the movie would have made approximately $103.81 million in total, tens of millions shy of what it would take to break even on the production budget alone. While a Chinese release certainly would have helped the film, there's no guarantee that it would have been able to actually save the movie from being a complete loss. Even though the movie wasn't able to make a substantial impact at the domestic or international box office, one would assume that the merchandise tied to the film would help curb Sony's losses. However, this isn't necessarily the case with Ghostbusters Answer the Call. Merchandise is where the real money is made from a movie when it comes to tentpole franchises, and it's a key factor in why Hollywood tends to look toward rebooting, remaking, and giving sequels to existing movies rather than investing in new intellectual properties. If a fan base is already there, then a movie will, more often than not, pay for itself. The incentive that studios have for selling merchandise rights is that they make an immediate profit off of making a deal. This is something that can be very helpful with Hollywood's ballooning production and advertising budgets, even in the event that the merchandise simply does not sell. It goes without saying that it is preferable for both parties involved if the merchandise does sell. Toy companies want their action figures to fly off the shelves, and licensors want to continue making money off of a partnership. So if toys and t-shirts sell well, then both parties win. If the products don't sell, then a company will have to renegotiate their licensing contracts and future merchandise lines could be jeopardized. Since the reboot was a big focus, most of the merchandise was based on Answer the Call. Sony's other big pushes for the return of the Ghostbusters franchise were to sell toys based on the original movies, a new video game, and a few new food and drink products. Of these products, the only thing that sold consistently well was the food stuff, such as Ecto Cooler flavored High C, a fan favorite. Everything else had a hard time getting off the shelf. Even then, the food and drink products were reported to be fairly scarce by numerous fan outlets online, and these products reached the clearance stage shortly after the movie was released, suggesting that not even the fans' love of Ghostbuster snacks would be enough to move significant numbers of units. On the other hand, Mattel had released a vague statement proclaiming that the Ghostbusters toys had outsold the company's expectations shortly after the movie was released. While this kind of announcement may have seemed like a good sign for Sony on the surface, the lack of any mention of expected sales figures, let alone any actual sales figures, remained suspicious. Even more suspicious were the multiple documented cases of Ghostbusters Answer the Call related toys going on clearance before the movie was even released, which happened with multiple chains across the United States. The only silver lining is that the toys based on the original 1984 movie seem to have sold better than the toys based on the reboot. But given that those were in shorter supply and also went on clearance around the same time as all other Ghostbusters merchandise, that's fairly cold comfort for Sony. This is where a different kind of demographic problem comes in. Toy companies typically have trouble with selling action figures of young women to younger audiences, with a few exceptions, as was the case with Rey from Star Wars The Force Awakens. 
Given that the movie was female-centric and that a very low amount of interest in the film came from children, this meant that the toy line was bound to run into issues from the start. Action figures of women sell better with toy collectors, who are predominantly adult men. But Sony went out of their way to alienate that demographic. Given that Sony was pushing the kind of people that would see the movie away from their products, only the most hardcore of Ghostbusters collecting enthusiasts would pony up for merchandise based on the new movie and its characters. Sony also created a tie-in video game in order to cash in on the franchise, a project rushed together in eight months which had more in common with a downloadable title than a standard full-price game. Prior to the game's release, it was announced that players who pre-ordered the title would get a free copy of Ghostbusters Answer the Call once it was released digitally, a clear sign that the publisher Activision was not confident in the game's sales, possibly along with Sony themselves. The game was maligned by both critics and fans and sold poorly, leading to the developer Fireforge Studios to declare bankruptcy a mere three days after the game's release. Sony would of course receive a percentage of what little money was made off the game, but it's abundantly clear that the game itself failed harder than the reboot did. Information brought up within the Sony hack also reveals further details. For instance, that Sony's royalty rate on the merchandise is roughly 12%, and that's before splitting royalties with Dan Aykroyd, Bill Murray, Harold Ramis, and Ivan Reitman. Sony's cut of Mattel's toy sales are reportedly as low as 3-8%, based on the data present in a 2012 Excel document. So even if Mattel's sales actually did exceed their expectations, Sony's profits on them would be smaller, presuming that Sony did not renegotiate their royalties. So finance-wise, what does that mean for the movie's break-even point? Presuming we go back to the $300 million to break-even, $400 million to $500 million to really profit model mentioned earlier, we're still looking at a likely loss of tens of millions of dollars here. The licensing fee on the merchandise, along with commercial tie-ins and product placement in the movie, should have covered a good portion of the expenditures on the film's ad campaign. That being said, these measures don't mean a whole lot if people don't go see the movie itself, which is why Ghostbusters Answer the Call was not worth its weight in ectoplasm. One might wonder why Sony would argue that their movie is a loss of only a few million dollars as opposed to dozens of millions of dollars. The reason that Sony has claimed that the loss on Ghostbusters Answer the Call is smaller than what outlets like The Hollywood Reporter and Bloomberg are reporting is because the company still has plans for the Ghostbusters franchise as a whole. Convincing investors to continue financing future movies will be more difficult considering that Answer the Call didn't bear the kind of fruit Sony were hoping for. Due to the movie's poor box office returns and tepid reception from audiences, Ghostbusters Answer the Call is very unlikely to get a direct sequel. This much is clear from Sony's current outlook. However, this does not necessarily mark the end of the franchise as a whole. Ghost Core, the subdivision overseeing production of all forthcoming Ghostbusters projects, is still up and running at Sony with a 2018 animated series in active development. The next film that Sony has plans for is animated, meaning that it will likely carry a price tag of $80 million to $90 million based on their previous animated efforts, leaving room for greater financial returns if the movie does well. While live-action movies generally bring in greater box office returns than animated films, it's likely that Sony will choose to wait a while before attempting another take on a live-action movie in order to distance the next film from Answer the Call. Beyond the failure of Ghostbusters and looking at how Sony Pictures is doing as a company, they certainly could have had a worse summer. Their moderate hit with Angry Birds the movie, alongside a slew of mid-budget successes like Money Monster and The Shallows, allowed them to brush off the losses presented by their big-budget bomb and pull in an estimated $45.9 million in profit for the company. It should be noted that an eight-figure return in profit for a slate of summer films is not particularly good, since the period typically encompasses 40% of a film studio's annual profits. But the relatively good return on investment for the lower-budget films suggests that Sony will be able to stay afloat with less expensive movies long enough for the next Spider-Man movie to put them back on track. It's also worth noting that the surprise overperformance of the low-budget thriller Don't Breathe is not included as part of these charts. If it were, it would have likely bolstered Sony's numbers presented by a decent degree. However, with Sony's corporate financial troubles outside of their gaming division, the company is in serious need of better results. If Ghostbusters Answer the Call had not been made, then Sony would have earned over $100 million in profit for the summer period. If the movie had instead done as well as they had hoped, then the company would have had a summer more comparable to Universal's than Fox's. The loss that has been sustained by the film will likely be blamed on producer and former Sony executive Amy Pascal, who helped push for the decision to completely reboot the franchise with Paul Feig at the helm, 
and the pressure will be on her future films to make up for this loss. Luckily for Pascal, her next two projects are Spider-Man movies, so it's likely she'll retain her current position with the company with a pair of surefire hits. That being said, prospects of her having any creative control over the Ghostbusters franchise going forward is minimal. If you like this video, please hit that subscribe button. Join us for spin-free news and analysis of the happenings and corporate politics behind the scenes of your favorite genre movies, as well as explorations of your favorite characters and their backgrounds and context here at Midnight's Edge.